Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Rashawn Didal. Oh, I'm going to screw it up. I told him I'd screw it up. <laughs> Indial, there we go. <laughs> I did it. And he is working on an app called Memories. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your app, just a tiny bit, and then the motivation behind it, because that's always the interesting part too. Sure, so Memories is a mobile application that we built for families experiencing dementia, really meant to support caregivers and those living with the disease with activity tracking, event reminders, and a chatbot for companionship. That's us on a high level, and uh, the motivation for this is my grandfather. He lives with dementia and about 10 other chronic diseases, and myself and my mother have been caregivers for him for the entirety of our lives so far, and he definitely needed support when it came to understanding whether he was able to complete his meds or make it to his appointments or not. He lives independently, and we didn't have that visibility unless we were able to call him and, and get a hold of him. Through uh, experiences post my undergraduate degree, I had the opportunity to work in the tech space and understand the capability of software for this population, especially with my grandpa in mind, and it's led me to think about a solution like Memories. Awesome. So how long has your grandfather had dementia? He's been living with dementia for, I would say, around eight years. Yeah, he started with uh, early cognitive impairment when I was younger um, as like the diagnosis. But I think um, as things have progressed with him, it's become more and more clear. And uh, the diagnosis came from the physician and it sort of made a lot more sense. And uh, yeah. Yeah, sometimes getting diagnosed takes time. Yeah. Especially because they can hide it or they the medical profession thinks it's it's something else, depression, or you said he's got other chronic illnesses. So it mm -hmm. could be something, you know, related to a medicine that's like overdosed, mm -hmm. which that doesn't sound quite right, but improperly dosed might be a better term. <laughs> so how did you, well, tell me about the app. What is it, you know, let's get into the nitty gritty of how it works and what it does. Sure. Like yes. that stuff. Uh, so there's, uh, I think an easy way to model this um, just for visualization is like the Uber app where there is a, a rider side and a driver side feeding into the same back end. It's a very similar model for us where there is a caregiver interface where um, you have the opportunity to input the meds that your loved one is taking, any events, whether that's exercises, appointments, or things that they need to do in the day. Um, and you input that and set the frequency and those push notifications get sent to your loved one throughout the day. Um, once the activities are completed or missed, you get a notification on your phone and you have the ability to see the reporting 24 7 to understand what's happening and uh, in case you miss your loved one or you'd like to connect with them you can share photos with them or call them directly through the application and um, for those living with dementia or who we identify as care receivers they interact with the mobile app on their phone that's run by our chatbot Iris, um, which is her name <laughs> and uh, she is basically meant to be a companion for the individual which will send notifications um, 30 minutes before the event, 15 minutes before at the time of the event, as well as in case it was missed, just to understand if um, the event was completed or if they need any support. As I mentioned, that information gets sent to the caregiver. And uh, throughout the day as well, uh, Iris will check in and ask how your loved one is doing pr and prompt conversation. What we'd love to do is understand how they're feeling. So we do have a mood reporting system. If they are feeling happy, we ask further questions as what made you feel happy? Uh, is this something that we can continue to prompt for you? Maybe you like talking about one specific memory or an activity in your day. We are trying to pull that information, make personalized recommendations. Um, and if there's any flags in your day, whether you're feeling sad or lonely, we try to recommend either calling your loved one, looking at the photos that were shared, or we share funny images or GIFs. Um, to try to provide some support. And um, this information also gets shared with the caregiver. So uh, what we're really trying to do is to create as much transparency between both caregiver and care receiver, whether um, your, age, your loved one is aging in place at home with you or if they're in a facility living elsewhere. Uh, and this is our core model of our application. And over the next couple months, what we would love to do is get some feedback from caregivers themselves 
and uh, develop features that make the most sense for them, whether that's increased reporting and a, a better way to interact with those living with dementia, because we understand that a mobile application isn't the best way for this population, of course, um, but we would love to be informed by them and by their caregivers and essentially use our technology as their platform for change. That was one of the questions I was going to ask is how do you help seniors who are not digital natives mm -hmm. and have cognitive problems deal with a, an app? That sounds like a giant, giant challenge to overcome just to use it. Absolutely. It, and it's, it's something that we are, are really focused on. We have two initial approaches, which we hope we'll be able to provide some solution, which we would like to roll out in the future. One is an integration to have the chatbot send text messages directly. So in case it's not a smartphone, just a regular home phone, or sorry, a regular cell phone, as well as home phone integration to have the messages come through as calls. Um, so if they do have some phone access, that's the model. The other way that we would like to move forward is by taking our chatbot out of the application and making it completely voice enabled so that we can interact with internet enabled things like a, a smart home speaker um, and just completely let the individual speak to their environment and speak to memories. That was my other question. Is Iris voice activated like Siri? Mm -hmm. That would be best case scenario for us, um, but what we'd like to, a little bit of a differentiator between us and let's say a Siri or an Alexa is uh, instead of increasing like the amount of things that you can do and questions that you can ask, we would love to have it be more personalized per individual and sort of understand what things really bring joy and facilitate those conversations. Considering this shelter in place stuff we've been dealing with for the last three plus months, I, I'm like, I'm kind of interested in the chat bot that'll find little happy things for me. <laughs> that's actually, no, I, I love that you brought that up because that's a, a future product roadmap for us is companionship for caregivers as well. And that's really the one of the, the main crux of why we built this application is outside of the uh, toll that dementia and cognitive impairment takes on an individual, caregivers face severe mental burnout, financial strain, and there's increased risk for a whole host of cardiovascular disease associated morbidities. And it's almost, it's, it's a hidden um, sort of need that isn't really addressed with a lot of the solutions or research that goes out there, the amount of hours of unpaid care, for example, that are going into this and the toll that it takes. So we would love to be able to support them as much as we can. Well, that sounds wonderful. And it's interesting because, you know, I, I look back on like my mom's journey. She had Alzheimer's for probably around 20 years. Wow. And she passed away this past spring. She was 77. And the, I think the only reason that she died mostly was because she broke her leg. And mm -hmm. it was kind of like you hear about, you know, Aunt Sally breaks her hip and, you know, she was fine. And then she breaks her hip and then she's gone. That was mm -hmm. kind of what happened with my mom because she okay. still walked and mm -hmm. talked. She didn't make any sense. Um, she wouldn't have been able to use the app. But I, there are people I know that are living with like, younger onset Alzheimer's or cognitive impairment from um, either another illness or, um, a, you know, tra brain trauma. Brain, my brain is not working today. <laughs> and I can see, you know, those people are closer to my age. You know, they're like in their 60s. So I, could, I would think they'd be able to adapt to a, a mobile app better than people in their 70s or 80s. Although you yeah. never know. <laughs> We're hoping that we'll be able to have some adoption, but we know that there's definitely going to be a barrier. Um, but it's a great point that you brought up because we've also spoken to folks around disabilities, for example, people living with acquired brain injuries, like you mentioned, or traumatic brain injuries, and other chronic diseases that also caregivers are in need of support. Um, but what I really think is... Um, as you mentioned, your mother may not have been able to use our application um, at the stage that she was at. And that's feedback that we've received. And I think uh, we totally understand that this is definitely geared towards uh, the earlier stages of the disease. But what I think may happen, and as we shift um, our model for an, an older population, is that we focus more on caregiver resources and support at that stage to really provide as much aid as we can. And then the things that can bring enjoyment for their loved one, whether that's playing music or any sort of memory activity or games that are able to keep them engaged and provide some value, I think that would be best case scenario. And maybe reminding about medications may, may not make sense, but increasing happiness at that stage would be best case scenario. Yeah, definitely. That's a definite, that's a definitely 
an excellent area of focus because I'm never sure. I think part of my mom's issue with her Alzheimer's, I mean, when you have it for almost 20 years, and my grandmother had most likely, my mom's mom, mm-hmm. had frontal, frontal uh, vascular, was it? She had a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months. Okay. So that's vascular. And then my, her mom, so my great grandmother, also had what they called senile dementia. That was back in the 60s. She died before I was born. So they didn't, that's, that's not a term they use anymore, but that's what they called it back then. So we have this family history, and my mom could see it coming. And I, I used to think she was in big denial, but now I think it's the, what is that, agnosinosis? Agno. That word where they you think they're in denial. It's just they don't mm-hmm. they don't know what they don't know, mm-hmm. and so I think things that just you know cute cat pictures or dog pictures or funny jokes or something that just gives you a, a chuckle is is really good for your health. So I think that's a really good focus. So how does your grandfather interact with it? How old is he, if I could ask? Yeah, so my grandfather, he's 72 right now, um, and it's actually an interesting situation because he has had a whole host of mobile phones <laughs> um, where we were trying different things where some are smartphones, some have really large digits um, to be able to dial and other things. Um, and we are, what, the way that I've been doing this is as I release a feature, I sort of have a conversation with him to see if this makes sense. Um, and uh, we're hoping that he, with his current phone, we're able to release the beta to him and we get some value out of it. Um, but what I'm really trying to focus on um, with my grandfather, for example, is he has a voice recorder um, where he stores really nice conversations he's had or, or songs or prayers. He's, he's quite a religious man that he um, really enjoys. And what I would love to do before I release the application to him is have a feature where I'm able to record the notifications um, to have that little bit of a personal touch. I think with him personally, it would go a long way. And with other individuals, it may uh, provide some solace to know that whether they're in a facility or not, for example, you can hear your loved one's voice indicating it's time to take your medication. So that's something I'd like to do for my grandfather. Um, Overall, um, the conversations are more about seeing how he's doing um, and and describing um, what it is that we're doing as a company, but mostly just having a chat and checking in. That makes sense. And I can, I can see like my mom lived in memory care residence for the last three years of her life. In the last 10 months, she was getting very combative, which is very typical, unfortunately. And she would, she would get feisty about taking her medication. I think because, you know, they had, they had to put it in their hand. They can't just like, pop it in their mouth like you would do a dog and although hiding it in yogurt was always a good trick Mm -hmm. she would tell them she would put in her hand and forget and then they'd say oh you gotta take your medication and then she'd tell them they were idiots so i would think a note a push notification that's recorded with like my voice or my sisters or one of the grandkids might have helped the caregivers in the residence just to be like, oh, hey, mom, don't forget to take your medication. You know, Maria's trying to give it to you or whatever. That's, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a way you can like kind of bring parts of the app in to somebody who can no longer remember what a phone even is. (laughs) No, that's a fantastic idea. And what we would love to do is support those care workers as well and facilities um, just and in a way that isn't a burden to the tasks that they're already plagued with, which is a lot to provide care. Um, If it's an easy to use ecosystem for us, what we're hoping to do is build API integrations and easy access because a lot of these facilities do track activities and things that they have scheduled for their residents. And we would love to just have that information feed into our system and be directly available to the caregivers. Um, Best case scenario is to provide as much value with the least amount of burden, which is a lofty goal. (laughs) It's something that we would like to do. And that is a little heavy, heavy of a lift. I do know with the, you know the seniors that i interacted with where my mom lived mm-hmm. and it seemed a bigger issue like 2 and 3 years ago mm-hmm. i swear those old ladies always needed to use the phone and they always needed a phone book <laughs> which you know i'm like i don't you i haven't used a phone book in oh probably close to a decade wow. so it always made me laugh because obviously I'm not of the generation that's a digital native, although I'm closer than like my mom's generation was. But I'm thinking if there's some way of like, you know, like communicating because they were always like, I need to call my son or where's, you know, where's Jennifer? She's supposed to be. It's like, there was always like this giant urgency 
And if they didn't have time to walk them over to the office and dial the phone and, and get their, their, you know, their adult child on the phone, it just added to the agitation of, I need to call so-and-so right now. Why are they not coming to pick me up? So I can kind of see it as like a, like a communications bridge. Like, oh, yeah. you need to talk to Jennifer? Here, use this. And I don't know if it would have pre-recorded messages, but it would have that communication tool that you're already working on. So that would be... Yeah, no, I mean, that's fantastic that you bring that up because what one of the reasons behind the in-app calling, for example, is that just by saying your caregiver's name, I'd like to call them, we can enable that conversation to happen without sort of having to deal with dialing or, or other things. And what we would like to do with that is enable voice calling as well in an easier way so it happens in-app. I think one of the, the major risks that, um, or not a risk, but what I see with um, popu with applications for this population right now is that there's numerous applications uh, across somebody's device. And that in itself is a lot just to be able to task switch and be prompted to go out. So we would love to have everything all in one. So whether that's embedded voice conversations or not. And I think that building off of the personalized messages, the whole reason behind sharing photos is to build that family album, essentially, that your loved one has access to. If you can record a message um, with some other family members that they always have access to whenever they perhaps miss you or would love some um, family support, that's a really great value add, I think, to be able to provide that companionship outside of what a bot can do. Yeah, and bots are pretty, pretty uh, interesting little little pieces of technology these days. Mm -hmm. I almost said creatures. That shows you my non-digital <laughs> natives. <laughs> it's like, I know when I'm communicating with one of them and it always amazes me. I always love it when you'll get through like a chat and you never get past its programming. And then mm. some, like I, this, uh, we were talking about this um, training I'm doing for the digital political organizing it asks, well, how was the training last night? I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. they say answer good or bad. It, it basically prompts you what to answer. And then it'll say, oh, can you sign up for another event? It's like, well, I signed up for all four. So <laughs> I, I texted back, I signed up for all four. And then it came back with like, you know, their version of an error message. Like, I'm just a simple bot and whatever uh. else it said. That cracked me up because I knew it was a bot because it's almost instantaneous. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's um, so when I mean, we're at the very early stage when it comes to bot creation. And I think a lot of it comes down to how folks design is really meant towards um, nudging behaviors. Essentially, that's it. It's meant to especially for sales bots, which you see on websites all the time. It's meant to nudge you down the funnel to get you to convert and to sign up for their newsletter. Once you're done that, great. I have no more purpose <laughs> as a bot. But I think the other um, application for this and what we're trying to explore really relates to the fact that um, there is a lot of repetitive conversations that can happen with an individual living with dementia, um, which is expected, and not having that um, sort of fatigue that a person can have, which in having the same conversation over and over is a real value add for the bot. And I think uh, the way to sort of explore that is by using user journeys from the start. And that's what we're trying to understand through feedback and by a pilot. So for example, I may think that um, my grandfather would want to have this conversation, so I'll design a bot this way. But if the, the idea for this conversation never even floats in his head, it makes no sense and that flow will never be used. However, if we spend some time with these individuals, gather their feedback and we say, okay, from their perspective, I'm going to interact with this bot because I want this output we can design the journey from there and it becomes much more streamlined and much more personalized. And it's, it's a different approach, but I think, and that's what sort of pervades all of our design is the user journey from the caregivers or from the individual living with the disease that we can use to impact technology and not the other way. No, that sounds fantastic. And it makes sense what you're doing. People are always impressed that I would frequently take my mom and another resident. They mm. all happen to be named Diane, made life easy. <laughs> you just call them all at once. And I would take the, like take two of them, get their nails done or take two of them to go um, to the park to watch kids. That's what my mom liked to do. And people are like, oh, I can't you know, you take your mom out. That's one thing. But you take two of them, like they talk to each other. That, yeah. gi that gives me a break because they very rarely got frustrated with each other when they would repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. Although funny story, my mom, my mom had this story about dogs that she repeated all the time. I mean, like she's been gone three months. I still don't want to hear it anymore. I can hear it in my head. I can hear her telling it. Don't, you know, it's like, I don't think I'll ever forget it. Even if I get Alzheimer's, I'm <laughs> going to remember this stupid story. And early on when she was living in the residence, she'd been there about six months. 
there was um i don't know why she had a stuffed animal in her room because she had her dog with her for the first half of her residency there and she starts in on this story and her neighbor you know resident friend person i'm not sure what you want to call them <laughs> she looked at her and she goes you've told me this story 803 times and i thought oh that's not cool she remembers you've told this story a lot <laughs> and then like a month or so later we're sitting out in the courtyard my mom launches into the story and the same friend starts parroting the same story and i was like oh my god that's like elder abuse <laughs> this poor other woman with alzheimer's is now parroting the story that you tell all the time oh, wow. because you've said it so many times you've programmed her brain <laughs> this is not cool and i was having i mean i was like in shock and i was trying not to laugh and i was just like it was one of those things where it's like I'm having a really strange mix of emotions because this is just really bizarre. <laughs> so, you know, if the bot wanted to listen to that story, it would not have hurt my feelings at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, that would be best case scenario, right? Having that conversation over and over and just understanding and sort of waiting the occurrences. Like this is a story that your mom perhaps likes to have and to communicate very frequently. Maybe we send a reminder, hey, do you remember, remember that story about a dog and prompt that conversation just to provide some value. So. <laughs> <laughs> who knows <laughs> i'm thinking oh don't prompt it while i'm there please <laughs> <laughs> but that was, you know i could see that as being you know beneficial because i did learn when she launched into that story i would try to like knock her off the track mentally mm -hmm. and by in interjecting a question about other dogs and that yeah. worked sometimes because basically when she was pregnant with me my dad's mom said well now you're going to be getting rid of your dogs right so this obviously upset my mom so that, you know, 50 plus years later, she remembered this story. The ingrained memory. <laughs> oh, I guess it was because it was never resolved. Okay. I don't know. It was just, but she would say that sometimes in front of my grandmother, who is still with us. She's 102. Okay. Wow. So it's like, you know, <laughs> please don't go into that story. She's sitting right here. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, it was just, it, and it was frustrating because it's like, yeah, okay, that was terrible. Can we move on? It's been a long time. It's been my whole life. And so I would ask her other questions to That's kind smart. of it was self preservation. <laughs> and if we were ever in, you know, if my grandmother and my mom and I were ever together, which didn't happen too often, but it happened a lot at my house, and I have three golden retrievers. So my mom would see the dog. I've had dogs all my life. I'd be like, oh, she's <laughs> dead. New, new path not that story please <laughs> she's sitting right here <laughs> it was crazy yeah it's just like the things you learn to keep the peace with somebody mm. whose brain is not working right is just insane so when do you guys anticipate launching your beta or have so you we're that? ready now. Um, okay. what, what we're trying to do as an organization as well is to reach out to as many caregivers as we can to test out our application. So we were faced with two options. We could either just publicly release, do a full app marketing campaign and everything, and just sort of run with the wind. But I think the better way for us to do it, because what I'm very grateful about is we have a large team at Memories, including an in-house development team that's very talented and really passionate about this space. And that gives us the opportunity to release our app directly to caregivers and receive as much feedback as possible and iterate before we fully release. Um, and I think that's that's definitely the plan that we're uh, approach, we're exploring right now. So if there are caregivers that are listening to this podcast, for example, or that are in different audiences that uh, come across what it is that we're doing, feel free to reach out on our website, www.memories.co, or get in touch with me any other way, um, and we'll directly release the application to you. Um, and I think that it's really, I'm excited for this. I'm excited for um, folks to say that 99% of this application is terrible <laughs> and just 1% has made a difference in my life. And that's best case scenario for us. And we can build everything else around that. Because uh, I think in conversations I've had with um, folks in the space is that there's no, there's plenty of solutions and ideas that would make a lot of sense, but adoption is the hardest thing. Um, being able to get somebody with cognitive impairment to use any sort of service outside of their normal routine is tough and understanding the needs of caregivers is tough. But I don't think that um, realizing that there's a barrier is a reason to stop. I think it's, wow, there's a barrier and it's stifled so much innovation. Let's just push through as much as we can and try to make a solution for these people, uh, for everybody. Because like, for example, people, uh, I mean, dementia 
is growing in prevalence. It, it's not stopping. And unfortunately, the, um, the, race, uh, the rampant research in the field has also started to slow a little bit because the results aren't as promising and it's tough to continue to pr- put money into a space that's not receiving amazing publications or, or things of the sort. And it's um, definitely not a, a global trend, but it's a disservice in general to this population. So we're hoping with the skills that we have on the tech side to be able to provide some aid. No, that makes sense. And I'll definitely make sure the website's in the show notes so that people can click through and contact you guys if they're interested in being um, beta testers, which I've done that a little bit with other mm-hmm. products. It's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like you said, dementia is, and unfortunately, it's growing. And if we don't make lifestyle choices that help slow the process, it's going to be really ugly. But you're going to end up with, you know, my generation, Gen X. Mm-hmm. Like I started using computers when I was in high school, so mm-hmm. not a digital native, but I'm not like I'm not out in the weeds with the non-technology skills. So, you know, unfortunately, more people that are much more tech savvy will end up with the disease, and more of us will be taking care of them. So, you're right; it's not just because there's a barrier to adoption doesn't mean it's a reason to just say, "Well, this is not this is a good idea," but so. Absolutely. And I think for, thank you. For, for me personally, I mean, I'm a med student right now um, and I worked in the tech space before and I'm pursuing my MBA. And I think the the blending of those two degrees and my previous experience has really served me well to sort of understand how um, healthcare professionals, me progressing to become one and current physicians and other researchers can use technology to make a difference. I think traditionally the fields have been seemed as so dichotomous um, and it's it's really not beneficial because what you see is a lot of physicians, for example, who really perfect their clinical skills, understand that there's a need, and then try to work backwards to create tech or to get continuing education or connect with researchers. But they don't have that approach embedded in them from the beginning, for example, or the appreciation of technology. And you end up creating solutions that are scientifically or clinically extremely valid, but the interface, for example, isn't easy to use, or the actual methods of distribution of the product aren't well understood. Um, So there's so many fantastic projects that are stagnated or in earlier stages that aren't really being explored. And personally, it's something that I'm hoping to be able to do through these two degrees. But just in general, um, with the the differences between the fields, it's definitely tough. It's, there's a lot of resistance. It's definitely not traditional to be able to, to mix these two things right from the beginning. So I urge other potential entrepreneurs or folks who are interested in sciences or in the medical field to really go outside of your boundaries if you're interested in tech outside of maybe just research, explore and try new things because, uh, I mean, failure will eventually lead to success. <laughs> well, trying new things is good for your brain, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed a more adoption of technology from the medical side of things since we've had this pandemic and all of a sudden, you know, we're not, you know, like, fortunately for me, I didn't have to worry about this, but, you know, I have friends who their loved ones are caring for might maybe kind of need a doctor visit because things aren't going quite right, but it's not an emergency situation. But, you know, for three months, doctor's offices were, you know, unless you absolutely had to go, they were all kind of off limits. And it was only like a week or two after my mom passed away that her doctor sent me a message through their system that said, Oh, we're doing telemedicine now. And I'm like, I needed that six months ago. (laughs) So I'm wondering yeah. if the, because I've talked to people that are in the research or um, there's one, um, I talked to a company called eFamily Care. Mm-hmm. So they're not a medical telehealth, but they work with the medical, like the healthcare providers. And that was really interesting. And, you know, they're churning along, working on their product and growing the business. And then all of a sudden the virus hits and now people really need their product. So they kind of got shot out of a can. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I'm wondering if you noticed like people are like, oh, technology is not such a bad thing for doctors and other, uh, you know, other like non-tech native businesses. 
Yeah, I think that's exactly what's happened. I think um, the pandemic has accelerated the need for solutions like this across so many different domains. And what I've been privy to uh, being a part of this uh, population of healthcare professionals at this stage of my life is that there have been a lot more call to actions from universities or government organizations requesting help um, from healthcare professionals or students with some expertise who sort of understand or at least try to keep up to date with their research and then translate their knowledge through resources the government or organizations organizations would provide and funding, whether that's creating contact tracing apps or other things. And I think for physicians, it's been phenomenal, the um, sort of understanding that the need for telemedicine is great and that there is no other time better than now to be able to move your practice forward, let's say through tech enablement, to be able to continue to provide care or think of innovative ways to provide solutions. There's a company out of Houston, apologies, I can't remember the name right now, but they used to build telemedicine solutions like software and other things. Um, but there's numerous software companies out there that can provide an interface to um, uh, to do telemedicine, but what this company has pitched or pivoted to do is to train physicians and how to use telemedicine um, software better and how to sort of work through that interface and provide the best quality care. And that's essential. And I think that's a wonderful move by that organization and it's what others should continue to do because there are fantastic physicians out there who have never been exposed to telemedicine before and they have so much skills to offer and they just need the support to get there. So all of these things have been accelerated by an unfortunate situation. That's for sure. It's like, at least there's like some silver lining with this crazy virus mm -hmm. pandemic stuff we're living through. Um, there was one other question I was going to ask while you were talking about the training. I love it when ideas pop in and then out of my brain. <laughs> oh, I know. They, um, for a lot of my, most of my listeners are in the United States mm -hmm. and we have a really big problem with rural um, hospitals closing. And of course the virus is not helping that situation at all. And a lot of really small rural communities don't have, they might have like your regular general physician, but they don't have specialists because there's just not enough population. So I can see all of these kind of apps really helping improve our healthcare and, you know, and, and not just providing like emergency type care or sick mm -hmm. care, but, you know, like the E, e family care, they were kind of a, an in between. They were like a, social worker that would be between you and the doctor and so if you had questions like i don't know if you've ever experienced with your grandfather when my dad was released from the hospital i mean he was he was diabetic and he had mm -hmm. other issues similar to your dad your grandfather excuse me but i don't think he had quite as many issues mm -hmm. and they're, they're like okay out of these 20 plus medications he's taking keep these ditch these change these add these and my sister my husband and i the three of us together are like holy crap, what if we do this wrong? You know, I mean, they literally, it was like printed on paper. None of us are stupid. Mm -hmm. And it and it wasn't like, it was just so confusing and it was so scary. So their, their um, you know, tele, telehealth, telecare would, you know, they'd have somebody that can talk you through that. Mm -hmm. And yours helps with companionship and reminders and, and communication. And then if you've got a doctor that can do this, so I can see this being a really, I can see a huge technology in, invent or innovation happening. And a lot of it was spurred quicker by this virus. I think, no, thank you for bringing that up because I had a very similar experience with my grandfather um, who he takes around 25 to 30 medications a day. Um, and he is a very particular man. So not always does he stick with the same pharmacist or he may move to another group. And because of that, sometimes things get lost in the wind and it's a little tough to manage. And um, I had to go there with um, my father, who's a nurse, um, to be able to see how my grandpa was doing. He took a new medication and we were unsure and he called us that he was unwell. Um, and being able to monitor, decide if we need to escalate to emergency services or something else is something that I realized that it's really tough to manage uh, medications specifically. And it, it's a route that we would like to explore further, um, just to be able to provide some value there. Because yes, you, you, people get provided with so much information. Uh, best case scenario is that the physician has distilled a great conversation with the caregiver, as well as um, incorporating pharmacists and other care providers into this equation. But that doesn't always happen, especially in resource strapped areas. Um, so being able to provide some value there is important to us. But I think 
Um, something that you mentioned that I really wanted to hit on is, so for telemedicine, for example, and other solutions that are looking to provide care to rural communities. Um, and I think this speaks to a larger um, discussion towards diversity, and it is something that we are trying to pursue actively as with Memories as our company. Um, and for example, uh, access to caregiving um, services as well as tech is definitely um, disparate for different racial groups and minorities, and whether you're living in a rural part of America or Canada or somewhere else, and per Pursuing that as a mission is something that we're doing and other companies need to continue to do and we hope is accelerated during this time. And I think there's just a one more level to this discussion where it's not just enabling telemedicine to a rural community by having doctors that can provide care. It's understanding that perhaps these individuals don't have tech access and they may need tablets or an interface to be able to communicate. And internet connectivity is the crux to all of this. Ensuring that there's adequate signal and resources to deliver um, is something that would warrant not just a physician, but a tech approach as well. And I think these multifactorial solutions is what I hope will come out of this, but is needed to provide quality care. That is a good point. I forget being from the uh, outside, just outside Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I forget that the world doesn't all have the connections I have. <laughs> Although, I, as I said before, we started recording our our family goal is to buy like an acre of property, mm -hmm. almost like on the edges of town. Um, there's a size limit to the second house if you do it in my town, okay. and there's spots that are good, but they have like internet connections that are like one step above dial-up oh wow so i haven't had dial-up since like 1998 <laughs> so and my daughter and her fiance are gamers my husband is about the only one that could probably live with crappy internet but the rest <laughs> of us nope not me not with the video chatting like yeah. we're doing now it's like uh, -uh sorry can't do that so i forget that you know that that's a that's a problem but you know and therein lies another solution. It's like we need to work on our economy and growing better jobs. So that kind of infrastructure to me seems like a really smart way to you know, move the country forward, but nobody asked. I totally me, so. agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been fantastic. Is there anything else anybody needs to know if they want to, you left your, um, the website. Uh, yeah, that's probably no, good uh, enough for getting a hold of you. I don't want to give everybody your email. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, for sure. Anybody can email me at any time. It's my first name, Rashawn at memories.co. Um, I think what I would like to uh, your listeners, if, if you are listening to this right now and hearing what I'm saying, I just want you to understand that um, I'm a caregiver myself. And the best case scenario for me is to use the resources that I've been lucky enough to have access to, which is a motivated team of individuals with expertise in healthcare and technology to provide a solution for you. So if you don't like what we're doing, if you have ideas on things Things that we can make it better please be extremely vocal with me and with our team because best case scenario for me is I can enable a better quality of life for yourself and your loved one that's all I want to do with my time so thank you for listening and that's all I wanted to say fading memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts